sorry about the funny accent. I am Australian. I've been here most of my life, but I'm originally from Texas. So you can imagine the accents are thrown down just a bit. I'd like to make the one thing clear. I think that we in the USA have quite a few crazy people. But I've observed that Australia, on a per capita basis, probably has as many crazy people. The difference is most of our crazy people don't have guns. So I, for years, have revert to myself not as a refugee. Sorry, as, not as an immigrant, but as a refugee. My background with aviation goes back to my father. He's the only one with captain bars, so I assume he's the captain. And that's the flight crew for a B-29. There he is again with the flight crew in front of a B-29. And he's being handed flowers by geishas, so I'm guessing that's in Japan. What I'd like to know is, how do you get scratches in your paintwork on your, <clears throat> your B-29 like that? My father went on to uh, pilot the B-36, which is a large airplane. And my experience with the B-36 is that when I was five years old, he snuck me out to the flight line and put me into an operational B-36. We went to the nose wheel compartment, he folded down a ladder, handed me up to it, instructed me to go up to the hatch. I went up and I noticed above that was a very tight spiral of stairs. And I ended up first in the engineer, engineer's area, in which I was very impressed by all of the dials and switches. We then went into the cockpit itself and to the uh, pilot and co-pilot's positions. And I was only five years old, I couldn't even see out. But I, to this day, have such a vivid memory of that experience. In later years, I actually used to work in the bomber plant making bits for F-111 aircraft. This was in General Dynamics, Fort Worth, Texas. I was at the time an engineering student, so they, one day they came and got me and took me to the special projects department. And there I learned some very interesting stuff. You know, one of my jobs, or one of my little specialities, was they would bring me skin panels from the F-111, and I would have a little repair kit that I would fit and send out for it to be bonded in to repair the panel. This uh, repair scheme was then used, I've got a second picture of a F-111 because it's such a beautiful airplane. Oh, I should mention, Australia made the F-111 last longer than anybody else. It was a very, very excellent plane for Australia. If they wrote a spec for an airplane for Australia, that's what it would look like. Anyway, there's a, a B-58, and again, a second picture just because it's such a beautiful airplane. And the, notice the pod underneath. That was a very thirsty airplane, and in that pod was fuel and or a thermonuclear weapon, and it could be detached. Now, the main, the main part of my talk today is going to be about the proximity switch, proximity fuse that can be fitted to uh, shells fired from, arm, from ground artillery. I start by mentioning a person who tied various uh, of these technologies together. The three major technologies of World War II were radar, the proximity fuse, and the atomic bomb. And this fellow that I'm going to mention now, a fellow named Deke Parsons, was involved in two of those in very pivotal positions. Who here has heard of Deke Parsons? William Sterling Deke Parsons. Born in 1901, he completed three years of high school in one year. At age 17, he passed the entrance exam for the U.S. Naval Academy. In 1980, he went into the U.S. Naval Academy. And as a cadet, he was given a tag, which in this case was Deke, meaning Deacon. They like to call him Deacon Parsons. And that stuck. In 1922, out of a class of 539, he graduated 48th, which is the top 10%. In that same class, graduated Hyman Rickover, who's known as the father of the U.S. Nuclear Navy. He graduated 107th, which is 20% top. Pretty good. Parsons did postgraduate studies in ordnance. He then became a gunnery officer and was promoted to lieutenant commander on the destroyer USS Alwyn. 
he was then assigned to a super secret project to develop a proximity fuse for artillery shells. And this is this is, was a very, very significant piece of technology. Who here has heard of a proximity artillery shell? Not very many, considering it was <laughs> so important to the outcome of the war. If you're curious, go to the History Network, where they clearly state that the proximity fuse was third after the radar and the atomic bomb in importance to the outcome of World War II. When they got the, the proximity fuse working, it was five to 10 times more accurate, or in terms of uh, kill rate, than pr the former type of flak type artillery shell. These previous shells had a timer. They would work out about how high the shell had to be to intercept an aircraft. They would set the timer, fire it, and mostly they made just big black blobs in the air. Now, next I will mention <coughs> Pearl Harbor. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the U.S. Navy was very aware of the sophisticated Japanese air-launched anti-ship weaponry and their absence of any adequate defense. The Navy was a sitting duck. They considered an, a, a proximity-fused artillery shell as a possible defense against air attack. An original concept was developed by the British which they developed, in which they were, developed a working design, which they shared with the U.S. as part of the Tizard mission. The U.S. took the design and ran with it, and it took, within 18 months, we're producing and working shells. It was a complete, completely pushed the envelope for 1940s electronics technology. The proximity fuse. In the nose is a coil for creating a radio frequency signal, a radar. Just below that is all the electronics, including four vacuum tubes, miniature ruggedized vacuum tubes. The U.S. evidently was good at making miniature vacuum tubes for hearing aids. Then down below there's various interesting safety features, and then there's a battery. The battery contains a glass ampule of acid and a shock of the, of the launch, which shatter the glass, and then the spin would fling the acid out into a series of rings of carbon and zinc that comprised a battery that provided the electric power to drive this thing. The uh, high frequency radio signal was sent out if it got within five or 10 meters of an object that would reflect, reflect the radar signal, it would pick that up, amplify it, and then through a frequency shift scheme, which I don't understand, would set off a detonator. The detonator then would fire the shell, and it would send the flak out in quite a, quite a large range around the shell. And a brief timeline of how all this was done. In 1942, the first production shells were tested. They got about a 50%, 52% success rate, which they considered was really good. 1942, they took the USS Cleveland out to a firing range where they immediately dropped three drones. And the range manager complained about uh, the loss of drones. They were hard to come by. Deke Parsons was there, instructed them on how to use these shells. Immediately, 5,000 rounds were shipped to the South Pacific. For security reasons, these shells were not, these proximity fuses were not allowed to be used over land. They were afraid that a dud might fall into enemy hands, and it was super, super secret. By 1942, they were well into production and they were producing about 40,000 fuses a day. They eventually brought this up to 70,000 per day, and all together, they produced about 22 million fuses in several sizes. So some people were busy using these things. As an example, after D-Day, they moved some of these shells onto land, and they brought down, they claim, a thousand German aircraft. 1944, the Germans launched a major V1 buzz bomb attack against London and Antwerp. 500 guns with proximity fuse shells were lined along the edge of the English Channel. The first week, they destroyed 24% of all the V1s. On the second week, 46%. 
Third week, 67%. And the last week of the offensive, 74% of all V1s. So we don't hear much about this, but they were very, very effective. Also, Antwerp was under constant fire. And again, I don't have any detail about how many were brought down, but Antwerp stayed open for the rest of the war and was a major supply base for the Allies. A little aside, the Battle of the Bulge in 1945 was the last major German ground offensive. They had amassed quite a few troops and tanks, and they're located in heavy forested areas. A major artillery barrage was directed at the troops using these proximity few shells. One photo shows trees that have all been cut off at the top at very uniform height. So you can imagine poor troops sitting on the ground having his breakfast, whatever, and he doesn't hear the shell coming because it's supersonic. All he knows is he hears a bang. And he looks up and there's shrapnel coming down at him. And the trees are also being shredded. So after the metal shrapnel, there's wood splinters. It decimated a lot of troops and demoralized a lot of others. So General George Patton stated two things about the proximity few shell. He said, the proximity few shell won the Battle of the Bulge for the Allies, and two, ground warfare would never be the same again. Anyway, that's the proximity fuse. It was very impressive and it helped the war effort a lot. Anyway, the Manhattan Project, which is the atomic bomb project, heard about this. And so they said, we have to have these people that produce this shell. So they poached uh, Deke Parsons. And he ended up on a train from Washington, D.C. to Los Alamos, New Mexico, sharing a, com a compartment with Robert Oppenheimer. They seemed to be uh, of a mind about everything they talked about. They hit it off very well. And by the time they got to Los Alamos, they had made it all their plans, specified the buildings they needed, the machinery, the staff, and the key personnel that they could acquire by pitching them from the other project. That's just a schematic of the uh, proximity fees. Oh, and just to mention, later, and I don't know when, they created a mortar round. These things don't have batteries. They have a little air ram system that drives a turbine and an alternator to provide the electricity. And you can set it to be an air blast or ground blast or other options. And they have a very, an infinite shelf life. So uh, quite a few of these were used. I don't know when. Oops, anyway, this is in uh, the South Pacific. Deke Parsons took, went with a series of these shells, and this is a picture of the first Japanese warplane brought down, which is two rounds of proximity fused shells brought down a VAL dive bomber. To close out that part of the top, in 1943, January, one of, there were two cruisers who were attacked by over 100 kamikaze planes and they were able to shoot all of them down. This picture is the cruiser Helena off the Solomon Islands. May 1945, the Evans and the Hanby shot down 150 kamikaze planes with proximity fused artillery shells. Anyway, back to uh, Dick Parsons joining the Manhattan Project. Basically, all his experience with gunnery uh, was useful. There were two designs for atomic bombs. Most people know about this. One was a uranium bomb, which used a gun type assembly method. Half the mass of uranium was at one end of the gun, the other half was at the far end of the gun. He would fire the one half down toward the other, and they would come together and make a rather large bang. This is an interesting photo I've never seen before. All those things in the foreground are what they call, they're, they're gun cases, gun barrel cases, or bomb cases, for what's called the thin man bomb. Very, they were long, unwieldy, would not fit in a bomb bay, and it was, this was what Deke Parsons was assigned to improve. In the background, you'll see the 
bomb cases for the Fat Man bomb. These are the plutonium bombs. And they dropped lots and lots of these things. <laughs> the ones in the background they call pumpkins. Parsons and his crew managed to shrink the uh, uranium bomb down to a six foot long assembly that used relatively little explosives and it was much easier to handle. Okay, for people who like facts, the little boy bomb contained 64.15 kilograms of 82.68% enriched uranium-235. Half of this was in a hollow cylinder with an outer diameter of six inches, a central diameter of four inches. At the other end of the gun was a solid cylinder with a four inch diameter. And when the bomb was fired, the big, the big bit was fired down to the little bit. And because it had a bigger area to push, it was easier to push. It took eight pounds of fast burn cordite and three off the shelf standard electric gun detonators to set the thing off, propel the big cylinder down to the, the barrel towards the four inch solid cylinder. When they came together, there was, there was a big bang. The plutonium bomb, which is also called the Fat Man, contained 6.2 kilograms of, your, of plutonium. It was about the size of a grapefruit, it was about, about the size of your fist. It contained 5,300 pounds of high explosives and 32 detonation points. The plutonium pit was squeezed down to a cylinder, so a sphere about the size of a marble. It then went bang. Now, who here doesn't know where Tinian Island is? We're now on Tinian Island. The U.S did an island hopping thing to get closer and closer to Japan, and Tinian Island was within the range of the main islands of Japan for a B-36, and from this base they did a lot of bombing. Little boy, uranium bomb, was sent to Tinian, and Deke Parsons was sent ahead to make sure he was all set up to receive it, and he did the final assembly, or he and his team did the final assembly. So here they are, you see them loading the little man uranium bomb into the Inova Gay B-29 bomber. Deke Parsons noticed when he got there that there were a few burnt out B-29s on beside the runways. And he thought, ah, what happened? He said, well, the B-29 was very much a developmental aircraft and they occasionally would crash and burn on takeoff. <coughs> he thought, a good fire would set off the detonators and would set off the bomb. If you set off the bomb on the surface at Tinian Island, you would sweep the entire island so smooth, smooth as a pool table with a large water-filled hole in the middle where the runways were. So he made a decision that it would probably be better to arm the bomb after takeoff. So he then got permission to do this and he spent hours practicing arming and disarming the bomb in cramped and dark places. After takeoff, before they reached cruising height, he put himself into the bomb bay and finalized the assembly of the bomb and the arming of the bomb. He then went back into the pressurized part of the airplane where they could then go to cruising height and get to the destination. On 6 August 1945, the Noah Gay dropped the first atomic bomb on Target City. Hiroshima, Japan. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, and the war was over. Post, a little postscript here. Dick Parsons and Robert Oppenheimer remained lifelong friends. They see each other and do all this other stuff. But in December 1953, he heard the news that his good friend Robert Oppenheimer had lost his security clearance. Now, to do what Oppenheimer did, dealing with these epic intellects, epic egos, there was a lot of toes tread on, and he developed enemies, and they went after him. And one of the things they could do to him was to take his security clearance away from him. It was more of an insult than anything. It so upset Deke Parsons that he had a heart attack and died the next day. The destroyer USS Parsons was launched in his name in 1958 and was christened by his widow. Oh, by the way, he ended up as a, as a rear admiral, which is unusual for a man who's never commanded a ship. <laughs>